Hey everyone, we recently got the latest and so far most complete version of the Omi Utility Program. Now it's dense with a lot of material, but I took my time digesting it, uh, developing my own questions and answers to them, and even some recommendations. Now in the end, I'll give my overall grade or conclusion of the OUP, so stick around for that. As I went through each step, it was clear to me that the team, uh, Reese, Puddin, and whoever else helped, they put a lot of effort and creativity in what really was a very difficult task. Now, it's not perfect. In my opinion, there were some really, really good parts and some other parts that need some tweaking. Now, we'll cover both, plus a few suggestions on how I think it could be a little better. Now, you can access the OEP from the Ecomi portal. Now, I'll link that down below. Let's start by looking at crypto to gem. Now, this is the process where you can use non-OMI cryptocurrencies to buy gems in the app. This activity will help fund the OMI to gem pool. So when you convert OMI to gems, it would get paid out from this pool. Now, this pool was also injected with an initial $1 million worth of gems by Ecomi. The first question that came to mind was, how sustainable is this system? Can the inputs match the outputs? Because I'm sure it was meant to be a self-sustaining perpetual system. Now, I doubt they spent all this time creating this just to tell Dan and Dave, hey, we, we got this process, but it'll cost you a million dollars every six months because it doesn't have enough gems. So I crunched the numbers. They did say the first thing to be implemented was crypto to gems, so it starts contributing to the gem pool early. Here's my attempt to figure out what that would look like in different scenarios. Now, I started off with Putin's burn spreadsheet. He was a part of the team creating the OUP, so I'm sure they started with it as well. These are the monthly gem purchases since January 2021, totaled by month. All the gem purchases to date have been by credit card. In the future, it will be from two additional sources. Crypto to gem, that's non-OMI crypto to gem, then OMI to gem, and also credit card to gem will still exist. Now, I believe credit card to gem will be the majority even when OUP launches. If we look at vendors who accept crypto, like Wikipedia, who accepted crypto payments from 2014 up until this year, less than 0.1% of their revenue came from crypto. The reality is it's just not used abundantly as a currency as the name suggests. Frankly, I think a lot of vendors who announced they're accepting crypto for payments were just using that as a marketing tactic, but that's a story for another day. So I think we can say it'll be minimal, but I'll adjust this later to see a more bullish scenario. Let's put 10% for now for each of the crypto inputs. The rest is bought from a credit card. At 10%, we get these estimates of gems bought with crypto. But these gems don't go into the pool, it's the fee on these transactions that goes into the pool. The team gives an example of a 2% fee and up to 2.8%, and we'll start with 2% in this example. We get these results of what would be the gem deposits into the pool. Excluding the first three months of 2021, since nobody was using the app back then, and excluding November because we haven't finished the month yet, then we get an average of 40.6k per month, a minimum of 7.7k per month, and a maximum of 124k per month contributed to the pool. Now this isn't the only inflows. We also have OMI to NFT seller fees and the fees on OMI to ticket and OMI to accessory. The last two I didn't explore as, frankly, I didn't think it'll be a lot since you can earn bronze tickets by really doing nothing. You can just stake a bit of OMI and earn bronze tickets. And I'm not too sure accessories will be too hot of an item. You know, Marvel Comics number one, the, the comic itself is what makes it valuable, not the stand that it's sitting on. So for sure, they'll contribute and they'll trickle a little bit of gems, but I don't think these will move the needle a significant amount. Fees on OMI to NFT are on secondary market sales. So from the total sales data from Puddin, I put an estimate of just the secondary market sales per month. Everyone will have a 1% seller fee until staking launches, and that will adjust your fee from anywhere between 0.5 to 2.5%. We use the 1% as an example here and get an average contribution to the pool of 2,000 per month, a minimum of 400 per month, and a maximum of 4.6k gems per month. When we tie this all together, we have a beginning balance of 1 million gems. Using the average numbers over a course of one year, we get total inflows of 511,000 gems with an ending balance of about 1.5 million gems in the pool. In October, I calculated 35,700 active users. That's users who actively buy on the primary and secondary markets. So each active user would then have a whopping $42.33 that they can convert per year before the pool runs out. 
Now, that's obviously not a lot. I do have a recommendation, but let's juice up these numbers a little bit to see what a bullish scenario would look like. Let's up the crypto buy-ins to 20%, switch from the average to the maximum monthly amounts, and that increases to $115 per year per person. Now that's not a lot, especially if you're a whale that wants to take advantage of the OMI to NFT buy-in discount, especially if you're a tier 5 staker. Now I'm sure that's a viewpoint for uh, one end of the spectrum. On the other end, it's actually not a bad system. Now, I'll explain why in a second. Plus there is a nice middle ground that I'll recommend uh, in a minute or so. Now the other end of the spectrum, while it might not be the best for those with deep pockets, let's understand what Ecomi is doing here. This is a big part of the new burn system. In order to maximize the burns, we need to max both the crypto buy-ins to fund the pool, but also those who take advantage of the OMI to gem. Remember, 100% of OMI used for OMI to gem is burned. Also understand that the goal is to have OMI purchased directly within the app itself. You get a discount based on your staking tier. So imagine you're trying to buy 50 gems and you have the option to buy it for $50 or 49. Now I know it's not a big difference, but as long as the steps aren't ridiculously different, you're going to pick the 49 in every case. So it's not necessarily to cater to the whales. The bigger objective is to ensure that every active user takes advantage of this. Because if we go back to uh, my max scenario, if all the gems that have flowed into the pool are purchased with OMI at today's price, that will burn 3.3 billion tokens per year. If the entire pool would be purchased with OMI, it would burn 4.5 billion tokens. But I don't think they would risk going to zero. I think the initial 1 million is a, is a safety blanket. Even if we go back to the average values, that's still over 1 billion tokens burned per year. So what's the middle ground? I say tier it. I think the Ecomi team knows this as they mentioned it could be based on staking tier and they will introduce a cap. But I say tier the cap and since I don't know what these staking tiers will look like, I'll use my Meta Monday data to give an idea of what that could look like. I think the basic criteria should be you've been active in the month prior, so that's why I'm going with my 35,700 active users in October. I also say that you need to own more than 10 collectibles, and for those tiers with 10 or more, you get an increasing allocation like what you see here on screen. Now this is just an idea, and I can see an issue that the Ekomi team will run into, and that's whatever allocation cap they use, it needs to be automated to avoid the whole securities issue. If they're actively and manually changing the cap, then that could result in OMI uh, holders generating a profit because of the burning. And that profit is from the efforts of others, which is a criteria in the Howey test. They need a formula or set of formulas to adjust the cap automatically, or the tiers automatically, set it once, build it in the system, and then don't touch it. The cap could be a very simple forecast. You know, you got your beginning balance, you project your inflows or deposits based on past data, and maybe use a run rate of the last three months, do the same thing for outflows, minus your minimum balance, so that could be the $1 million, and then you get your total amount for the next month to allocate to the different tiers. I'd normally say add in a timeline of marketing initiatives or a calendar of the drops because those can affect the gem inflows. Now we see that in the data, but because this needs to be passive and maintaining those kinds of schedules is an active process, you can't do that. You need to keep it basic. Overall, it's a great system. In its current state, it's not gonna please every single demographic. But if you zoom out and look what it's doing for all OMI holders, it's creative and it looks like it's gonna work. Let's move on to OMI to NFT. In short, you could buy NFTs with OMI. The buyer pays the purchase price plus fees in OMI. Then the fees are burned. The seller pays fees in gems and the fee goes to the OMI to gem pool. The default fee will be tier 3 or 1% until staking is available and then your staked tier will determine your fee. Now there was some controversy on Twitter earlier in the week regarding OMI to NFT. A gentleman named Javier mentioned an issue with the seller fees with OMI to NFT. All fees must be basically prepaid in gems. If you don't have the gems, you have to deposit them just to list it. And it's not even guaranteed to sell. For whales, not the biggest issue, but I could imagine a new person on the app and they land, say, a Captain America Comics number one, Secret Rare. Now, if it sells for 10K, asking a newbie to deposit $1,000 just to list it is a tough pill to swallow, especially if people start undercutting the price. There is, however, another side to the coin if we look at the numbers. In the current system, if you want to sell your collectibles for OMI, you have to first sell it for gems, then convert it to OMI. 
let's say we have a Disney collectible which sells for 10k. We subtract the fees, so there's no seller fee right now, but there is the VV market fee and the license store fee, and finally the cash out fee of 10%. In the end, you get $8,150 worth of OMI. With OUP, with that same 10k collectible, you now have the seller fee, and I've used a tier 3 or 1% for this example. I'll show you the different tiers later. Add in your VV and license store fees, and there is no cash out fee here you end up with $9,050 worth of OMI. Currently, you're paying 18.5% in fees, but with OUP, you're only paying 9.5% in fees, with a 9% savings. 9% is not a small amount. Now, depending on what your staking tier is, you could save anywhere between 7.5% to 9.5% uh, with OUP when cashing out collectibles with OMI. So what this comes down to is OUP gives a pretty good reduction in costs, but a temporary strain on your cash flow, which you then get back when the transaction completes. Overall, I'd say it's a good thing because the cash flow restriction is temporary. However, let's be real, it is an inconvenience for most, but the demographic that it really hurts is the new and small collector who lands something big. If I had to choose, I'd say saving 9.5% with OUP is the preferable route. That's a decent amount. Even as a non-staker, you're actually saving 7.5% which is a material amount still. But again, I'm worried about the small collector who love the products, but who just can't operate with that kind of cash flow. We need to think about the little guys. I get it, licensors need to be paid out in gems and Ecomi cannot act like an exchange. So I'll leave this info here for you guys. I'll let you guys process that. This is where we are and this is what we're giving up, right? I don't have a recommendation right now, but if you do, let me know, let the Ecomi team know. Let's talk about OUP tickets. Now, I don't have much value add compared to what's already on the website, but what I found useful was putting everything in a chart. There was a lot of words, and just being able to compare and contrast it in this format just helped my little brain grasp it a little better. So here it is for you guys, and hope it helps. Now, in 30 seconds, I'll just quickly explain some of the key points, uh, the key points to me. Now, the bronze and gold tickets help secure collectibles on the waitlist. Silver tickets waive buyer fees. Gold tickets guarantee a drop as long as there are less gold tickets than collectibles. However, they also will be key in acquiring VV vs. LAN. So I'd wait before using a gold ticket on a collectible and make sure LAN isn't available at that time. One thing mentioned in the Discord AMA is that the LAN you get from a gold ticket will be part of a special area that only gold ticket holders can access. Public sales of LAN will be a separate area. And all tickets expire at the end of each season. All right, I hope that chart helped. For more info, please visit the site. I don't want to put you all to sleep just regurgitating the site information. Let's move on to staking tiers. There are five tiers, each with an increasing staking amount and with an increasing unlock period. Now, if you follow the default progression, it will take you 225 days to get to the top tier. Now, these tiers also determine your buyer and seller fees, which affect the calculations we looked at earlier. You can fast track as well by burning a set amount of OMI from $500 worth to $4,000 worth. Now my question is, is it worth it to spend 7.5K to fast track to the final tier? If you have 40K of OMI to stake, but you're deciding on fast tracking and spending an additional 7.5K, well, let's see what we get. You get almost all the collectibles if you progress naturally, because by the end of season one, which is 90 days, you'll be at tier three. So if you fast track by the end of season one, in terms of collectibles, you'll get a difference of two secret rares and one ultra rare. Now, these are going to be VV branded collectibles. I get it, they're gonna be pretty rare and they'll be really big flex pieces, but I'm not too sure it's worth it because they're not even FAs of VV branded stuff. But let's continue. Yearly rewards will be the same because it takes less than a year. It takes 225 days to progress naturally to the final tier. Now, bronze tickets will be a big difference. It's a difference of 280 bronze tickets, which again will be used for a better chance on the drop. Personally, I'm not a fan of more bronze tickets. You can get a bunch anyways by just staking a bunch, and they're not a guarantee for collectibles. They're just an increased chance. You do get slightly less fees and higher burn rewards, which ultimately can turn into even more bronze tickets. But the big difference is the extra five gold tickets, because that could be land in that special area in the VVverse. The big question is, will land be available within the year when staking starts? Because if it isn't, you need to remember, these gold tickets expire, so we need clarity on that. 
The extra parcels of land make it somewhat intriguing. Without it, it's not even close. I wouldn't consider fast tracking. If Ikumi wants more incentive to fast track, maybe we can go back to that gem pool tier idea. You can add in a dimension here that is dependent on a person's staking tier. Just an idea. Let's talk burns very quickly. Now the burn sources were scattered all throughout the portal, so I just want to summarize them in an easier to read format for you all. We previously had the third party burns and potential burns from land sales. Now we have burns from buying bronze and gold tickets with Omi, Omi to accessory, Omi to NFT buyer fees, Omi to gem, unstaking fees are burned, and tear up fees are burned. Land has some very big potential, and I covered this in a previous video, and Omi the Gem is the replacement to the burn buyback system, as the perpetual system that will continually burn tokens as a uh, core function within their ecosystem. The others are nice to have, but in my opinion, those two are the ones to watch. Now we get to the burn reward system. You basically accrue points for how much Omi you burn, which you can spend on more bronze tickets and OUP fast tracking. Honestly, this is where I started to say, this is kind of getting too much. You know, it's a lot of information for new users. And this burn reward system is just another thing to keep track of. If we tie this all together, on one hand, it is complex. I do worry about the casuals and the small players in the space. I already mentioned that the whole prepaying of these seller fees is a very tough pill to swallow uh, for the, again, the small and the new users. So I hope they understand that it's ultimately a cost savings from the current system, as the numbers showed. Ultimately, OUP is complex because it needs to be. The team behind the OUP had a daunting task of creating a system that made the token deflationary, acted as a utility behind the app, it has the ability to pay licensors, ensure regulatory compliance, but not acting like an exchange or security, and do this all in a system that is self-sustaining and operates perpetually without intervention. So while it is complex, it needs to check all those boxes, and they've done so in a pretty creative way. At the end of the day, I'd rather have all those boxes checked and have that complexity than not to have it and just be like every other NFT token out there. You can't be a pioneer by being like everyone else. So let's see where this goes. It's not perfect. So if you do have suggestions, there is a feedback form. Here's something interesting. There are three forms, the OUP survey, the feedback form, and the OUP IP. All three ask for your VV username, which I thought was kind of odd. Do you get an airdrop if they like your suggestion? Or maybe even if you just submit something, you might get something. Now, don't go spamming the forms now. It's just something I saw and I thought was kind of odd. Now, I'll be sending them this entire video just to make it easy on myself. Anyways, that's my review of the new OUP. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.